results, particularly in the second half of the year. Assets under custody and administration increased 4% quarter over quarter to a record $34.4 trillion. We saw a strong level of new wins during the quarter, totaling $294 billion, which took our total wins in 2019 to just over $1.8 trillion, within touching distance of our record amount of wins in 2018. Assets yet to be installed stood at $1.2 trillion at quarter end. At Global Advisors, assets under management increased 6% quarter over quarter to a record $3.1 trillion, supported by higher period end market levels and strong U.S. and European net flows to our spider range of ETFs. During 2019, Global Advisors recorded over $100 billion in total net inflows, driven by strong ETF institutional and cash net flows relative to 2018. Relative to the year-ago period, fourth quarter total revenue increased 1%, reflecting improved servicing and management fees driven by stronger equity markets, partially offset by lower NII and markets revenues. On a sequential and year-over-year -year basis, fourth quarter total fee revenue increased 5% and 2% respectively. Full year 2019's total revenue decreased 3% year-over-year, as a result of lower fee revenue and NII, partially offset by the positive contribution of Charles River development. We are pleased that we were able to begin to grow servicing fee revenue again with our focus on client service. Servicing fees increased 3% during the second half of 2019 relative to the first half of the year. During 2019, we implemented a number of client initiatives to drive better service quality and deepen relationships. This included the completion of our senior executive client coverage model for our largest clients. We also implemented a new client onboarding process that has enabled us to scale rapidly and take on large tranches of business, while also meeting client service requirements. Further, we implemented changes to better manage client pricing decisions with the establishment of an executive deal review committee. We know that there is more for us to do and as we begin 2020, reigniting total revenue growth remains a core strategic priority for all of us. We believe that building out our front-to-back alpha platform strategy provides an attractive value proposition for our clients. During 2019, we undertook significant actions to improve our operational efficiency and reduce expenses. This time last year, we launched a comprehensive firm-wide expense savings program to aggressively manage down expenses, driven by new resource discipline, process re-engineering, and automation efforts. Initially targeting $350 million of gross expense saves, we subsequently increased our expense savings target to $400 million, which we exceeded, finishing the year at $415 million in gross expense savings. Part of our efforts were aimed at tackling headcount growth, which had, been, which had been too high for too many years. During 2019, we successfully reduced total headcount by 3% from year-end 2018, driven by automation and standardization as well as process re-engineering, with high-cost location headcount down by over 3,400. As a result, we reduced our full-year 2019 expenses, excluding notable items in CRD, by almost 2%, thus exceeding our initial target of 1%. As we look to 2020, we remain focused on reducing our total expense base again. This past December, I outlined the outcome of the initial reassessment of our technology cost structure. In the coming year, we are targeting a change in the trajectory of our IT expenditure, aiming for it to be flat to down 2% during 2020, excluding notable items. For resource discipline and process re-engineering efforts, we are also targeting a reduction of total expenses company-wide, excluding notable items, by approximately 1% during 2020. During 2019, we were also particularly focused on balance sheet management. As a result of a number of deposit initiatives, as well as improved client engagement, we have recorded a third straight quarter of total average deposit growth. In addition, as a result of an improvement of balance sheet under stress, following the 2019 CCAR stress test, we increased our quarterly common dividend by 11%, 52 cents per share. Further, 
we returned $2.3 billion to our shareholders during 2019, including $500 million of common share repurchases during the fourth quarter. To conclude, during my first year as CEO in 2019, we have faced a number of challenges, but through our actions, we have made measurable progress towards our goals, particularly expense management and capital return. My focus for 2020 will continue beyond delivering a distinct value proposition and world-class service to our clients, enabling us to reignite revenue growth while generating further expense reductions and sustainable improvements in our operating model. We remain confident in the trajectory of our business. We expect that our global reach and expertise in servicing and data analytics, combined with our unique front-to-back alpha strategy, will enable us to realize our vision of becoming the leading asset servicer, asset manager, and data insight provider to the owners and managers of the world's capital. With that, let me turn it over to Eric to take you through the quarter in more detail. Thank you, Ron, and uh, good morning, everyone. Before I begin my review of our fourth quarter and full year 2019 results, I'd like to take a moment on slide four to discuss several notable items. In 4Q19, we recognized $110 million of pre-tax repositioning costs consisting of severance and real estate, which sets us up to drive further process automation and organizational rationalization in 2020. We also had $29 million of acquisition and restructuring charges primarily related to Charles River as expected. And in addition, we had a $44 million gain related to the tender of subdebt in 4Q19 and a $22 million after-tax cost associated with the redemption of our Series E preferred securities. Taken together, we recognize notable items of $95 million pre-tax or $0.25 cents per share. You'll find a bit more detail in the appendix. Moving to slide five, on the top panel, we show our quarterly and full year gap results. On the bottom panel, we show results X notable items for those of you who want to see some of the underlying trends. I would note that we were able to generate positive operating leverage in the fourth quarter on both the GAAP and X notables basis, helping to improve our 4Q19 pre-tax margins both quarter on quarter and year over year. Turning to slide six, we saw end of period AUCA levels increase 9% year on year and 4% quarter on quarter. The year on year move was driven by higher end of period market levels and client flows partially offset by a previously announced client transition, which is now largely behind us. Quarter on quarter, the AUCA increase was mainly due to higher end of period equity market levels, client flows, and net new business. AUM levels increased 24% year on year to a record 3.1 trillion, driven largely by higher end of period market levels and strong net inflows of approximately $100 billion, which were spread relatively evenly across our institutional cash, and the spider range of ETFs. Amidst a challenging organic growth environment for asset managers, State Street Global Advisors realized AUM share gains during the year in both money market funds and across our low-cost ETF array. It's a reminder that our business is positioned to further scale its offerings and to improve margins in doing so. Moving to slide 7, servicing fees were up 1% year-on-year and 2% quarter-on-quarter. As Ron discussed, while industry pricing pressure persists, the pace of quarter-over-quarter servicing fee headwinds continued to moderate in 4Q19, with this quarter's results showing three consecutive quarters of stable to increasing servicing fees, primarily driven by higher average market levels and net new business. And while equity markets were supportive over the course of the year, we are confident that management actions taken since late last year, including the rollout of our new client coverage model and newly formed executive pricing committee, have had and are continuing to have an impact. Nevertheless, there is much more to do, as Ron mentioned. Driving higher servicing fee growth will remain a strategic priority in 2020. And we continue to see significant interest in our front-to-back alpha platform, we now have four wins, all of which have expanded our scope of business with existing clients. On the bottom right panel of this page, we've again included some sales performance indicators to provide a little more texture. As you can see, AUCA wins totaled $294 billion in 4Q19 and approximately $1.8 trillion for the full year. The sizable wins this quarter and throughout the year again demonstrate the benefit of our scale and capabilities as we build new relationships, 
and continue to grow existing client relationships by providing additional products and services. Turning to slide eight, let me discuss the other fee revenue lines, beginning with management fees. For Q19 revenues were up 6% year on year, primarily due to higher average equity market levels and inflows from ETF and cash, partially offset by mixed changes away from higher fee institutional products. Compared to 3Q19, management fees were up 4%, driven by higher average equity market levels and inflows from ETF, partially offset by outflows from institutional. FX trading services were down 7% year on year and 4% quarter on quarter as the business was negatively impacted by low volatility levels, partially offset by higher volumes. Securities finance revenues were also down 8% year on year and 4% quarter on quarter due mainly to lower industry volumes and spreads. Finally, software and processing fees were up 18% year on year and 54% quarter on quarter, reflecting higher CRD revenue and positive market related adjustments. Moving to slide nine, you'll see in the top left panel a five quarter summary of CRD's standalone revenue and pre tax income. For Q19, CRD generated 126 million of standalone revenue, which was up 4% year on year and 48% quarter on quarter. I would again remind this audience of the lumpiness inherent in the ASC 606 revenue reporting accounting standard and not to read across any one quarter's results. On the upper right panel, we've also included a comparison of CRD's 2019 standalone revenue versus an estimate of 2018 revenue pro forma for the ASC 606 reporting standard had we owned the business for the full year. As you can see, CRD generated $401 million of revenue in full year 2019, up 8% versus $372 million of estimated pro forma revenues in full year 2018. On the bottom right panel, we wanted to provide you with a bit more texture around the momentum we're seeing in the business and how we've enhanced it since our acquisition last year. We remain confident in the revenue and cost synergy goals announced at the time of the acquisition. Turning to slide 10, NAI was down 9% year on year and 1% quarter on quarter, with our NIM declining 19 and 6 basis points respectively. The sequential decrease in NII was primarily driven by the absence of episodic market-related benefits seen in 3Q19, partially offset by increased deposit balances. Excluding the episodic uh, benefits seen in 3Q, NII would have been up 2% sequentially. Our deposit gathering initiatives continue to generate benefits. Average total deposits are up three straight quarters and up 3% year on year. Interest-bearing deposits are up 9% year-on-year, and non-interest-bearing deposits have been steady for the third straight quarter at approximately $29 billion. On the earning asset side, we targeted careful growth in client lending and a modestly larger investment portfolio, with both the average 4Q loans, X overdrafts, and the investment portfolio up 12% year-over-year. On slide 11, we're again providing a view of expenses this quarter, X notable, so that the underlying trends are readily apparent. Year over year, our 4Q expenses, excluding notable items, were down 2% and flat quarter on quarter. You can see consistent improvement in the comp and benefits, as well as several other lines. As you recall, we announced the 2019 expense program this time last year with an initial target of $350 million. And thanks to a significant company-wide effort, we achieved approximately $415 million in saves in full, on the full year, exceeding our initial target by nearly $65 million. And so let me provide some color on a couple optimization initiatives that were really helped us reduce costs last year. First, supplier negotiations and consolidation have been a big focus. We've made great strides in both telecom and tech infrastructure services, while also consolidating the number of our IT vendors. Second, the organization has been focused on realizing greater productivity. Automation initiatives launched last year have now led to four consecutive quarters of total headcount declines, resulting in high-cost location headcount reductions of about 3,400 this year, more than double our original target of 1,500. More to come in 2020 as we continue to work on every line of the P&L. Moving to slide 12, 
during the quarter, we returned a total of approximately $686 million of capital to shareholders. And for the full year 2019, we returned approximately $2.3 billion of capital, representing 108% of net income available to Common. As we executed our 2019 CCAR plan and delivered on our priority of increasing our capital return to shareholders. Moving to the right side of 12, you can see that both the standardized and advanced approaches to that one ratio is at a healthy 11.9%, even with that level of capital return. We also consciously reduced our Tier 1 leverage and SLR ratios, primarily driven by the post CCAR redemption of our Series E preferred stock, which is worth about 12 cents of EPF. We remain confident in our capital position and believe that we have incremental opportunities to continue to optimize our capital structure as changes to the capital rules are finalized. Turning now to slide 13, I'd like to cover our full year 2020 outlook as well as provide some thoughts on the first quarter of 2020. Before I start, let me first share some of the assumptions underlying our current views for the full year. At a macro level, we are assuming slow global growth interest rates based on the current forward curve, and a modest uplift from equity markets, as well as continued low market volatility, which impacts our trading businesses. So, beginning with revenue. We currently expect that fee revenue will be up 1-3% to 3% for 2020. This includes servicing fees growing modestly at the low to middle end of this range, management fees growing at the high end of this range, and CRD revenue should grow at low double digits. Regarding the first quarter of 2020, we would expect fee revenue to be down quarter over quarter by low single digits, perhaps 2-3% to given headwinds, such as the expected asset mix shift by a single client in asset management, as well as seasonally lower CRD revenue. Regarding NII, we expect it to be down 5-7% in 2020 versus 2019, driven by the carryover impact of lower market rates and some continued rotation in the deposit book. Starting first quarter of 2020, we expect NII to be down about 5% sequentially, driven by the full quarter impact of the October's Fed rate cut, lower day count, and the fourth quarter long-term debt issuance. On a positive note, we do expect that NII should largely stabilize in the second half of 2020, assuming, of course, that there isn't a significant change in the interest rate environment. Turning to expenses, as you can see in the walk, we will continue to be laser focused on expenses and expect to achieve approximately 4 to 5 percent in savings, driven by our continued focus on resource discipline and process engineering, as well as our technology optimization plan. This will include a reduction in headcount of an additional 750 roles in high cost locations in 2020, which is related to the repositioning charge I mentioned earlier. These expense saves will be partially offset by approximately 3 to 4 percent of ongoing business building investments in areas like CRD, tech infrastructure, and the variable cost of new business growth. This should, this should yield a net 1 percent reduction, excluding notable items, in 2020 total expenses. Regarding first quarter 2020, we expect expenses to be largely in line with this guide year over year and consistent with the seasonal expenses usually occurring in the first quarter. Taxes should be in the 17 to 19 percent range for the year, but we expect first quarter 2020 to be at the high end of that range. And finally, given our strong capital position and recent capital optimization, we expect to continue to actively return capital to common equity holders in the form of payouts and returns, subject, of course, to the Federal Reserve scenarios and associated approvals. So, moving to our summary of full year 2019 results on page 14. We were pleased to see fee revenue improve over the course of the recent quarters as management actions and moderating fee pressure helped drive total fee revenue up 2% in the second half of 2019 versus the first half. At the same time, we continue to navigate a challenging interest rate environment and enhance NII with deposit gathering initiatives with three straight quarters of total deposit growth. We also successfully executed on our full year 2019 expense savings program significantly exceeding our initial savings and headcount reduction targets, and helping drive down expenses, ex notable items, and CRD by 2% year-over-year, demonstrating our ability to bend the cost curve. 
we're committed to doing more in 2020. Finally, we continue to optimize our capital structure and delivered on our promise of increased capital return to shareholders with approximately $2.3 billion in capital return in 2019 for a total payout of 108%. And with that, let me hand the call back to Ron. Operator, uh, can we open the line to questions? As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound or hash key. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Our first question comes from Brennan Hawken with UBS. Your line is now open. Uh, good morning. Thanks for taking the question. Um, Eric, you just ran through a, a bunch of color on uh, expectations for the year in 1Q. Um, one that I was hoping to dig a little in on is the fee revenue side. Um, I think you said that the 1Q fee revenue growth down 2 to 3% sequentially, and you gave a couple factors. Um, does that guidance um, include what we've seen so far year-to-date in the equity markets, which has been pretty robust, or is that a potential offset if it proves to be durable through the quarter? Thanks. Brennan, it's Eric. The, uh, the guidance is effectively as of you know, a combination of the end of the year, and obviously if there's large dislocation between then and now, we factor it in. I think you'd say equity markets are up. Volatility still, though, on, uh, you know, in trading is still pretty, uh, you know, pretty light. We've not seen that, you know, big January, you know, uh, uptick that uh, I think we used to four or five years ago. Um, you know, interest rates have been, uh, you know, I'll call it puttering around. So I don't think there's a lot uh, that's really changed, and this is a, an outlook effectively uh, based on what we, uh, you know, what we see, uh, what we see now. I think, as I described, you know, there's some of this is just the the usual seasonality, like in Charles River, which you know peaks in fourth quarter just because of the cycle of sales that come through, and then dip in first quarter. Um, you know, we have some vis visibility into into servicing fees. At the management fees, I uh, I noted, you know, we'll so it's kind of a combination um, that uh, that we're looking at. That's that's all really fair. Uh, thanks for that color. And and then when we think about some of these robust uh, equity markets that we've seen, and and um, you guys have clearly done a really good job of trying to get your hands around the elevated fee pressure that you were seeing, you know, over early 2019 and, and leading into that. Um, in the past, we've seen some breakage in fee rate when equity markets rally really hard, um, really fast, because your, your servicing fees are not all just purely contractually, you know, a percentage of AUCs, basis points on, on, on assets under custody. Um, some of them are, are you know, uh, inflation, some of them are pegged to um, activity levels and the like. So can you help us um, think about sh should we be prepared for optically, the way we model State Street, some fee rate pressure here in the near term just because of those mechanical um, factors, you know, rather than thinking, um, I just I know some people think that when equity markets go up, okay, then the servicing fee is going to go up uh, with with the fee rate being flat. And I, in the past, it, it hasn't worked out that way. So just trying to think about how to calibrate for that. Thanks. Hi, Brennan. It's Ron. Um, let me begin on that. I mean, in the past, you're correct. Uh, there has been a cycle when you've seen sharp up equity markets that has been followed by a uh, a relook by the client base at, at what they're paying and a uh, Favor fee renegotiation, and and that's still possible. I think what's different this time is, firstly, uh, we have uh, comprehensively been through the client base, either uh, at their bidding or at our bidding. Uh, in some instances, we've been the proactive one, uh, wanting to uh, put control of the situation. Uh, we've tended to get more term out of these things, and in general, the level of partnership that's uh, between us and our clients now is, is, is at a much higher level. So I would suspect uh, my, my, uh, my expectation 
would be that uh, certainly there'll be some conversation, but I would not expect uh, the same kind of effect that we've seen in the past. Yeah, Brennan, I'd just add the kind of quantitative uh, side to this is, remember, most of our fee schedules in the servicing business are based off of averages, you know, average for a quarter or, you know, multiple months within a quarter or have you. And so it's worth just remembering that if you tick through the uh, um, depreciation in stock market indices, and I think there's a good table on the top right of uh, page six in our slide deck, you know, the S&P and, and this is 4Q to 4Q, but if you if you think about it on a full-year basis, which uh, I think a number of you had, the S&P was up 29% end of period to end of period. That feels great. But the average was up only 6%, right? Uh, you know, the uh, AFA average point to point was up 18%. On average, it was actually down 4%. So it's really the averages that are factoring through, and I just encourage you to think about those as you – Think about modeling the, uh, you know, the servicing fee uh, um, uh, effects, uh, and and in effect, and, and and in addition, you know, those are what the, uh, but what we focus on both from a from a, as we think about the calculation of servicing fees, but also what the clients uh, uh, think about as uh, as part of the billing process. That's great color. Thanks, and, and apologies for jumping in the weeds straight off the bat on you. <laughs> Quite all right. Our next question comes from Glenn Shore with Evercore. Your line is now open. Hi, thanks. Uh, curious if you could talk, and you might have touched on it a little bit, but if you could talk on your deposit optimization efforts, what's working, and where you are through the process you've been going through client by client. You know, 4% growth is good. Do you consider any of it a repo environment related and transient? Uh, just, just curious to get the mark to market on that. Sure, Glenn. It's, uh, it's Eric. Let me start. Uh, you know, deposit initiatives were something that we really uh, uh, began to focus on. Uh, you know, fourth quarter of eighteen, I think I'd say, and then you know, it's been an intense effort for you know four or five quarters now. Um, and it really uh, is in response to thinking about how do we serve our clients with our balance sheet. Now, as you say, sometimes it's deposits, sometimes it's, uh, you know, cash money market sweeps into uh, – sometimes it's uh, uh, some of the sponsored repo that we do. So there's a series of different uh, 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 areas. Um, I don't think it's particularly – uh, the, the, the results of those initiatives, you know, on a year-on-year -year basis are, uh, you know, north of uh, $10 billion of deposits tend to be more on the interest-bearing side because that's what's, uh, you know, what's discretionary. Uh, it's come in probably three buckets. The, the largest of the buckets is working with our custody clients and thinking about how to serve them on their discretionary cash. Sometimes it's uh, the asset managers. Sometimes it's insurers. Uh, sometimes it's the uh, pension funds. So that's been a that's probably been the biggest piece. We've also, I think, built up over uh, time a book of uh, corporate deposits because remember, not only do we have partners and suppliers for our corporations, but because of our uh, custody of the pension plans, right? We have often an introduction from the pension, uh, the, those defined benefit pension plans or 401k plans into the corporate treasurer, and so that creates a, a natural uh, access. And then the third bucket is, you know, we always supplement with a little bit of uh, uh, CDs or broker deposits, but I think that's been probably the smallest of the so – those are the kind of initiatives we've taken. They've been, I think, material in terms of continuing to build our balance sheet, which then lets us, uh, you know, provides enough uh, uh, oxygen in effect for us to build our loan book, our investment portfolio, our trading book, and so – you know, that's kind of part of how we think about uh, running the bank. Um, and then, you know, specific to your question of would it have been, you know, better, different, lower, higher because of, you know, quantitative easing or not, I don't think the initiative would have been uh, particularly different. I, I do think there is uh, more deposits in the system, in the banking system, and we've seen some of that probably starting in the second half of the third quarter. You know, when the Fed began to intervene, fourth quarter, it's hard to dimension how much there is, but you know, 
tie both read the, the Fed a date report, and that kind of gives you a little bit of, a, of an idea. I appreciate that. And, and maybe one more on just the servicing wins, 294 in the quarter, 18 for the year. If you look at that, that's over 5% organic growth. Now, obviously, it's a gross number, not net. Don't know if you want to share just a ballpark range of where where net is, but then the specific question is is it, it, if you can help us with the composition of what's in the one but not yet funded pipe. I see some of the press releases. I see some ETF wins in there in the fourth quarter, but maybe just help us think through what's in there. Yeah, Glenn, it's Ron. It's it, it's it's a mix of things that are in there. Um, it, it's you know some of it is true. Uh, one-offs, meaning uh, we've won something, uh, it's in the queue to be installed, it'll be installed. More typically, uh, just given the nature of our client base, which tends to be larger asset managers and asset owners, uh, when, we, uh, when we win something, we install in tranches. Sometimes uh, it could be very conventional business, like we, have a, we had a very large mutual fund win earlier in the year, some of the funds are more complicated than others. Uh, sometimes the client wants it done in a particular sequence around their fund boards. So there's some of that in there. Uh, you can probably uh, draw the conclusion that the more complicated uh, the The other thing that's in there, though, is uh, increasingly the nature of our business is that we're not just winning a but we're winning um, – all or a portion of the front to back, meaning there's some middle office in there, there might be some Charles River in there. So oftentimes what you're seeing is a installation of another service for an existing client where we had an install earlier in the year. That's the way to think about it. Got it, okay, that's, that's interesting, I appreciate it. And is it, is it in and around the range of the average margin because I know going piece by piece would be impossible, but just like the one but not yet funded, is it coming in as, as at a at a higher level, average level, or below average level? Glenn, it's Eric. It's a, I think as Ron said, it's a mix. It's a, you know, we'll, uh, it's it's a mix of uh, fee rate, and mix of timing, and you know, as you could see, the the dollars was was. High a quarter ago, it's high again this quarter, and so sometimes this installs more quickly. Sometimes the I know it's hard to model. I just encourage you to put a big cool. Well, your outlook comments help, so we'll take it at that. Thanks, guys. Our next question comes from Ken Usden with Jeffries. Your line is now open. Oh, thanks. Good morning, guys. Um, the follow-up on the uh, NII outlook, Eric, uh, I was wondering, uh, when you talk about the expected decline next year, can you just give us a little bit more color on just the dynamics of how much and how the lower rates from last year still roll through on the NIM, and also against you know your point about there being some excess deposits in the system, but you're still growing these deposits from your strategic initiatives, can the balance sheet also expand to uh, continue to expand from here? So I guess it's just a, a split dynamic of what happens on the NIM side versus what happens on the balance sheet. Thanks. Yeah, Ken, it's uh, it's Eric. You're right to ask the you're, you're asking the volume question and the rate question. So uh, um, maybe uh, let, let, let me let me do that in in that order. I think from a volume perspective, uh, the two drivers that we see in this business are. Uh, firstly, uh, the uh, amount of uh, wins that we have in uh, in custody and accounting, because those typically come with the individual deposits that uh, the frictional deposits. Those will those will come based on the kind of the win rates that we have and some of the. I think the other one is the deposits in the system, and I think we've we've clearly seen a bit of an uptick, uh, you know, uh, quarter over quarter, you know, based on the, the, the bank-wide data, as well as some of the, you know, uh, our results and a couple of the other uh, banks. So you've all seen that in the I think the question is, what happens to deposits in the banking system over the next year? You know, did, did we just, did the Fed in effect with its uh, 
uh, easing uh, uh, process over the last, uh, you know, four, five, six months, you know, get us to a new level, and then we just, you know, go back to the the the, the slow, you know, build off of that, or is there going to be more or less Fed activity? And I, I'll leave that one to, you know, for you to uh, to to think about. I, you know, I think that one's the un. You know, we do expect some amount of, of modest uh, deposit growth. I think the what, what we're careful on on deposits, and we still uh, expect to see, is some amount of continued rotation from non-interest bearing into interest bearing, or you know, interest bearing in treasuries, because you're seeing that in the underlying uh, you know asset holdings of our of our clients and in the industry. We think about the volume of deposits going forward, we're comforted that there have been, you know, three quarters in a row of, uh, uh, of stable non-interest bearing deposits. But I'll remind you, third quarter and fourth quarter of 18 actually saw an uptick in uh, non-interest bearing deposits. And then it, it, it fell by, you know, it fell significantly in the first quarter uh, of 19 from for Q18, so we're we're hesitant to uh, you know to think that we're we've gotten to a sea change. We we like to see a you know a flattening of that line, but we're we're hesitant to uh, to call that uh, you know a sea change just yet. Which is why we do think there will be some continued quarters in the year. Um, I think from a rate standpoint. It's everything you'd expect. Is long rates still uh, still have a negative effect on a full year basis against well, uh, long rates? I guess I should say long rates uh, have a negative effect as the tractor of the investment portfolio plays through. And you know, unless long rates pop up, you know, 30, 40, 50 bips, you still have that playing through to a negative. You know, you have the short rates uh, uh, at our kind of have been reset and so we're gonna we're it's gonna take you know three or four quarters to lap ourselves have uh, that effect uh, playing through then you know you have some uh, quarter uh, as an example you've got some um, transactional impacts right as we you know called those PREP we replace them with long-term uh, debt right because we have TLAC requirements so in effect I end up with uh, higher net income, but uh, the uh, uh, the you know I get it. Uh, we get higher uh, available to common, but uh, we also have a uh, we also uh, have more interest expense because of how the uh... anyway. I, I'm hoping I covered uh, uh, yep. most of what you said there. Yep, and just one more just balance sheet structure question to your point on the preferreds. You did that redemption. You said you were able, last quarter you were able to do that before getting even the final. Could you continue to do more in that in, uh, be, ahead of getting the finalization of SCB, or does now SCB finalization really lead any further decisions you make about the balance sheet structure and, and capital actions? Thanks. Yeah, Ken, uh, fair question, but obviously we're you know any any kind of decision by by us around CCAR or about you know, interim, uh, you know, capital actions is that we, we just don't have an ability to, 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 uh, to telegraph uh, beforehand or to uh, uh, us. Um, I just tell you, we, we always look at the full range of what we can do. We're always conscious that there are, you know, periods immediately after CCAR where one tends to, you know, have an opportunity. Um, it gets a little more delicate in the first quarter. so. Um, let me let me just leave it at that. It's the it's the kind of thing where I don't think timing matters a ton about when we uh, uh, when we take our capital actions, but uh, um, we are looking at obviously the the change in the uh, in leverage rules, and then importantly, we need to see how the SCB comes through, and uh, you know that uh, that I think we'll know in the coming. Start to gear up for the, uh, you know, for these uh, for our annual uh, annual CCAR uh, process. Our next question comes from Alex Losing with Goldman Sachs. Your line is now open. 
Thanks. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, Eric, I was hoping to dig into NIR in the quarter um, around some of the deposit cost trends. If I look at the non-U.S. side, it looks like it was a negative, you know, four biffs kind of number. I know there's some FX dynamics that are all through that that could create a little bit of noise, but can you help us understand just kind of where you guys are in terms of deposit costs, how you expect it to evolve from here, and if there's anything one-off this quarter that, that helps out? Yeah, Alex, uh, it's Eric. I think there are a couple probably elements here that are flowing through the uh, uh, deposit costs on the U.S. side and then the, the non-U.S. side. And the, the page for those of you on the phone are, that's probably best to look uh, through is the financial uh, addendum that we have, uh, page 7. There's a detailed sort of average balance sheet table of the last eight quarters uh, for everyone. Um, on the U.S. side, you see our deposit costs, uh, you know, came down, I think, a nice uh, 19 basis points. Uh, uh, most of that is on the U.S. Uh, USD side. You know, obviously, this is the domicile view, not the currency view, but it's, uh, it's indicative. Um, and that's really the effect of that October rate uh, cut and the full quarter effect of that coming through adjusted for, you know, our mix of pricing and so forth. And so I think you see the sort of data is in that kind of 50% range that flowing through that line. The non-U.S. domicile is a little, uh, little messier. Um, part of what you see there, and that one uh, fell, those interest, that interest expense fell more than, uh, than, than you would naturally expect. It actually went from a positive interest expense credit in effect. Uh, part of that was, remember, the ECB moved, and we uh, we moved as well. We actually, our beta was, uh, was on that ECB. National markets, as, as other banks are doing as well, uh, given that it seems like it's going to be negative, not for a, you know, in a temporary period, but for a, you know, foreseeable future. And so, That you know what kind of NIM should be earned on deposits because of pain, and then we also have uh, less in the in the FX swap costs, and so we had less uh, swap expense that line of the having the footnotes, and that just bounces around a bit. Cost of being on the uh, Got it. That's helpful. Thanks. Um, and then a slightly bigger picture question to you guys on profitability. I guess when we take a step back, obviously very nice move on expenses uh, this year, and you guys have more to do uh, next year. Um, I guess when you go back a year or so ago, you had a slide out talking about medium-term uh, pre-tax targets, uh, kind of shooting for two uh, percentage point improvements in pre-tax margin. Um, that's still the case, but I'm curious what, what's the base and what's ultimately the, uh, the destination here, because in 2018, pre-tax margins were... 28, 29, you guys are kind of 26-ish uh, this year, so um, I guess off of which base you'll be thinking about the two percentage point improvement. Thanks. Alex, it's, uh, it's Eric. Let me start on that uh, because I think it's something that we've we've obviously been, you know, thinking through. The markets, uh, you know, when we set those up, when the markets were at a certain point, they, they work against us both on the equity market side, which has, you know, largely bounced back. Now we need to kind of, it's going to take a few more quarters to get to a place where we're, uh, where we're pleased, and that was in our outlook. But it was also at a time when NII, right, was expected to go up, and NII has actually gone uh, the other way. And I think I mentioned in one of the conferences late last year that, you know, that, that change in NII cost us effectively two points of margin. Um, that said, that's just, uh, that's just information. I think when we think about how we need to run this business, uh, we still need to uh, drive towards those uh, those targets and drive to those targets at pace. And I think we've been clear that, you know, at the time we set those, that the pre-tax margin was in the 28% range. And I tell you, if we're at 26% now, you know, we need to, we've got plans to get to 27% and 28% and 29% and, you know, ultimately get that uh, three handle or the, the, the 30 handle. On margin because we think this is a business that should operate at that level and I think if you work through some of our 
know, guidance for this year, you see us making headway on margin, um, you know, driving uh, revenues up and expenses down. And I think you continue to expect that kind of, you know, uh, leverage, operating leverage and margin expansion is, uh, you know, is kind of tantamount and kind of, Kind of a fundamental part of our planning process, so we're uh, we're we're standing by those targets. We think they're important. And, uh, they they were they were well set, and 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 uh, uh, are, uh, you know that's where we're headed. Great. Thanks so much for that. Yep. Our next question comes from Brian Vidal with Deutsche Bank. Your line is now open. Great. Thanks. Good morning, folks. Um, you just come back to the um, the pricing pressure concept and asset servicing, and, and, and w one detail I did miss if you could just clarify the um, the fee uh, fees down two to three percent in one Q, just the servicing uh, asset servicing fee component of that for one Q. But the broader picture, uh, the broader question is, um, you know, we, we've had that four percent pricing pressure I think that you identified Eric a while back, and that had been moderating to that sort of um, two percent headwind. So just just want to get your thought about that headwind coming into to 2020, and clarify that that's um, that is uh, separate from a mix shift. And when I talk about that, is a um, you know the the, the common uh, mix shift towards the ETFs and away from mutual funds, which I know are lower revenue capture, albeit they are um, just as I believe they're just as profitable because of the lower cost of servicing them. So maybe you could just talk about that dynamic in the, uh, you know, as, as how that shapes that 2020 uh, one to two percent up for servicing fees. Yeah, uh, why don't I begin this, uh, Brian? Because there's there's a, there's a lot in what you asked in terms of, uh, of of pricing and and how we think about and our outlook on 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 pricing and pricing pressure. I mean, if you look back on this business. Or time immemorial, right? There's uh, there's kind of enduring uh, deflation in the business, which uh, we've all come to uh, know and live with. Result of uh, combination of business growing, ability to scale, um, et cetera, uh, and, and that's been historically at two percent. Um, there's also been mix shift that's been underway since then too. I mean, the the, the mutual fund to ETF move. Uh, is not new. It's certainly accelerated over the last few years. So, and we expect that mix shift to continue. Um, I mean, the other factor in here is there's increasing concentration amongst ETF providers. Um, we have a very large market share amongst ETF providers. Uh, but obviously, as those providers get larger, the nature of the fee rate typically is such that uh, that they're paying uh, they're paying us less than the marginal asset. So. But this is the nature of the business, and that's what we have to deal with. So um, we do think and believe, and we said that uh, that uh, inordinate fee pressure that we saw uh, starting in 18 and continuing on to 19, we think that's abating. But we, uh, this is a business that um, has lived and will continue to live uh, in the face of uh, of ongoing fee pressure, which is why. Uh, Focused on our operating model, yeah. uh, how we build a business not only meet that, but that can uh, uh, become more profitable in that kind of environment. Brian, it's Eric. Let me yep. let me add a little bit of a quantitative kind of um, uh, estimations that we've been doing uh, to kind of help Ross. Uh, so on on pricing, I think as he said, you know, historically there's always been a two percent went on pricing and um, two years ago we saw that pick up to four percent of a headwind 17 to 18 and then last year if you think about 18 to 19 that was also a four percent I think we've described how we've been marching through a set of you know renegotiations and uh, As we look into our book of business and think about this coming year, what's factored into our out, outlook 
is approximately a 3% uh, uh, pricing headwind, so down from the 4%. And, you know, we've got some visibility, good visibility into the first quarter and second quarter. And so, you know, that's, that's factored into uh, to our outlook on servicing fees on a full year, uh, a full year basis. Um, to your point of uh, where does mix come out, mix comes out in how we describe client flows and activity, and it's been relatively neutral. You know, activity's up a little bit with client back on activity, but flows, you're right, tend to work the other way around. So that's been a more neutral effect in aggregate relative to past history where it's been a slight uh, positive of a point. Um, and then finally, on first quarter, you asked, I'll just remind you that uh, what I guided to on uh, on fees for the quarter uh, was uh, down 2 to 3% in aggregate for fees. The, uh, the downdrafts that I noted were in management fees. Uh, and in CRD, uh, and uh, so uh, by omission, I didn't really cover uh, servicing fees because uh, we expect we expect those to be flattish, you know. Um, and okay, that that's that's great color. Maybe then just on on CRD, um, you know, uh, you guys reiterated the um, uh, the the revenue and cost energy uh, outline that you had uh, uh, from from day one. Um, I know that's mostly a 2021 impact in terms of where you want to be. Maybe just an update on sort of the um, uh, sort of the, the, the timeline into that, or, or, or how you're thinking about 2020 in terms of um, uh, part of that 260 to 280 million um, revenue goal for 21. In other words, uh, is that uh, are you making material progress? Do you think in 2020 as it relates to uh, to your guidance there? Brian, it's, it's Ron. Uh, I, I would say we absolutely are making uh, material progress, and in terms of the synergies that we outline, both revenue and cost, um, uh, we expect those to play out largely in the time frame that we discussed earlier. But the you know, the more important impact, uh, or, or the even greater impact of Charles River, has been around uh, how it's for business and changing the nature of the conversation and the relationships that we're having with our clients. As we noted, uh, we uh, find four uh, so-called front-to-back deals or alpha platform in 2019, so in just over a year of ownership, um, which in, in essence means that we have a, a comprehensive and complete relationship with the client front-to-back. Pipeline there remains very strong, and even in those cases where uh, we're, uh, the, the likely outcome is not full front to back, it's changed the nature of how we're dealing with our clients from a one-off product provider to a true uh, business process uh, outsourcing partner with these clients. That trend will uh, carry on and, in many ways, fundamentally change the servicing business to the bottom. Yeah, that, that, that's great. And, and, and is it more of a linear progression through 2021 or more of a hockey stick into 21 as the deals, uh, you know, as you sign these deals in terms of revenue? I mean, I, I, I'd, ex I'd expect it'll be largely linear, but, uh, you know, with a bit of an uptick as we continue to build out the platform. I mean, we announced over the, over the year uh, various platform partners that we'd added to Alpha. And, you know, these are uh, these are providers that are plugging into our platform, and typically where we get a we get a share of those economics. And I think you'll see at an increasing rate over 20 and 21 uh, the number of those kinds of providers on the platform, and you'll see then the increasing importance of of platform economics. And that will be less linear and more. It, it's like how any platform grows, right? Um, yeah. It, it, starts out small and then momentum builds as more and more become part of the platform. Brian and yep, Eric, that, that, to add to that, the, the kind of, if you think about the revenue trajectory on the synergies, for example, um, part of what you'll see is uh, some of the leading indicators like bookings have started to tick up. You saw those were up 28% on a year-on-year -year basis. And so that's what will begin to drive the, the Charles River kind of specific revenues uh, this year and next year. I think in contrast to that, 
some of the revenue synergies were around uh, connections with the State Street uh, uh, base of revenues. And in particular, you know, the trading, uh, the trading and sponsored repo kind of uh, revenue activity uh, that's, uh, that, that we've quickly tried to link into Charles River tends to actually happen earlier in the three-year cycle uh, than later just because of the, of, of the speed at which we could either make the, the client uh, kind of connections or the you know, uh, order management system connections. So there'll be a mix, and I think sometime this year we'll, we'll probably uh, do maybe a, maybe a more fulsome kind of where are we you know, as we're, you know, a year and a half, two years into this deal and, and, uh, and, and try to share more information. Sounds like that would be helpful. Yep, perfect. That's great, Carla. Thanks so much. Our next question comes from Betsy Grafik with Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Hi, good morning. Hi, Betsy. Um, Eric, I wanted to just uh, Eric and I, I wanted to just dig in a little bit on some of the comments around the expenses. I think during the prepared remarks you mentioned, um, you know, that there's more to come, and I would expect that. Just wondering, um, should we anticipate that the pace of change, the rate of change of expense reductions, is something you think you can continue for the next few years, or is this a, um, you know, 2020 we get the one percent down and then, you know, it's more. Um, hold it steady or uh, continue to grow? So, Well, I should say continue, but, you know, g grow in line with just, you know, core expense um, pressure. So just wanted to get your understanding as to the duration of uh, your expectations around the more to come. Thanks. Betsy, let me begin on that. And while we're not giving guidance beyond 2020 at this point, um, I, I would say that our ambition is to continue to uh, to manage expenses down offset by the necessary investments that we need to make. Uh, we believe that there's more room for productivity improvement. Our automation efforts are underway, uh, but we have much more in front of us than what we've accomplished. So we, we see a path to uh, uh, continued and ongoing expense management, uh, certainly through 2020 uh, and likely beyond is the way I would think about it. And, and part of that is you, you, we, if you're going to win in this industry, that's what you need to do, right? Uh, we've talked about the servicing fee pressure. We've talked about the pressure that's, that's on our clients, but it's also just about being able to scale uh, at, the, at the level that we need to. Uh, I mean, if you think about the amount of new business that we brought in, the, the, those assets could only have been brought in if there was confidence on the part of uh, the client base that we would be able to scale that. And I just think that to be the leader in this business, we have to continue productivity improvement, driven by automation, driven by process redesign, take on business like us. And if Betsy, we get... Go ahead, Betsy. I was just going to say, if we get a you know, slightly different rate environment where, you know, rates come down again, do you feel like you have the flexibility to ramp up that invest, you know, that um, expense reduction? Betsy, it's Eric. I, that, that was partly where I was going to go. I think we're quite conscious that in a, a, a slower, you know, top line uh, uh, growth environment, you know, we're signaling 1% to 3% on fees this year. You know, that's a year where you want to hold expenses, uh, uh, actually bring them down, right, because we need to create some some real uh, operating leverage and margin expansion. And so, yeah, I think part of the answer to your question is if, 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 if revenue growth is in the, you know, that low single digits, then expenses coming down is the, is the right answer. I think to your point um, and, uh, 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 and uh, precise question that, you know, if, uh, if if revenues take a you know a downtick, whether it's interest rate driven or you know something else on the you know equity markets uh, or something, um, then we would go deeper into expenses and we'd you know ration our reinvestment and just do it at a uh, perhaps at a different pace. Uh, we'd find ways to uh, to uh, to accelerate some of our uh, other optimization efforts. You've seen what we're doing in IT, for example, that we described in, in December. We'd go deeper there and just, just think about, you know, where we were in uh, December, I'm sorry, January of 2019, 
you know, we, we announced 1% down and felt like, uh, you know, through the middle of the year, the environment hadn't gotten appreciably different. And so we ended up with 2% down. And I think that that's the kind of, you know, incremental action we would uh, find a way to, to, to deliver uh, if, the, if the environment were not uh, favorable. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Our next question comes from Jim Mitchell with Buckingham Research. Your line is now open. Hey, good morning. Um, maybe first question, um, just on the, the C21 ratio standardized, it jumped uh, 60 basis points, looked like a $5 billion reduction in uh, RWAs. What, kind of what drove that, and is there more to do there? Jim, it's Eric. Um, I think you're, uh, you're on the capital uh, ratio pages where we've shown uh, this quarter both uh, standardized and advanced. And we did that because, you know, our binding constraint now is, is effectively both. They're almost right on top of one another. Right. Um, and I think you need to be a scientist to really understand the trend in each of those uh, capital ratios. So let me try, and I'll, uh, we'll, we'll do a follow-up uh, if, if necessary. So standardized, you remember, is more volume-driven with some very you know, relatively simplistic factors. And so the standardized ratio um, actually uh, uh, improved because standardized RWA fell uh, sequentially, and that occurred in particular uh, in the, uh, the standardized RWA of our FX activities and our secur uh, uh, securities, uh, I'm sorry, our SEC lending activities. Uh, and, and that's kind of related to the lower levels of volatility in the market and lower uh, uh, action. So that was the, uh, the biggest downward driver of standardized. Um, if you take out your PhD and want to think about advanced RWA, um, our advanced RWA went up, which is why the advanced ratio came down sequentially, and the advanced RWA increased because of loan growth. Uh, and investment portfolio growth, and a little bit of uh, ops risk uh, primarily. So those were it's a little bit um, apples and oranges, but that was the driver, I think, from our perspective. We, uh, it just, it's a good reminder that, you know, we live in a, in a world of both, and we uh, obviously, uh, you know, uh, uh, will we'll manage to both. I think what I found um, comforting is, you know, notwithstanding all our capital actions that we've taken, and our higher payout, we actually are at real healthy capital levels, and that obviously gives us, you know, flexibility going forward. It sets us well, it sets us up well for uh, this cycle of CCAR, uh, and uh, uh, you know, we can take things from there. You know, absolutely, uh, standardized is what matters for CCAR, and that going up is, is certainly a, a nice uh, positive. So, but maybe just as the second question, following up on your guidance of kind of fee revenue growth of 1% to 3%. Um, just maybe to push back a little bit on it, um, if I look at 4Q fees and normalize for seasonality and processing fees um, and then just annualize 4Q, I get to almost 2% growth in 2020. So it doesn't feel like a very ambitious uh, target when you think about the S&P is now currently 8% above 4Q average levels. So you have a pretty big tailwind in the markets. You have about 3.5% of growth from um, a AUCA that's yet to be installed. The 1.1 or 2 trillion is equivalent to 3.5% growth. You have a market tailwind and you only have about 2% fee income growth. Is there something we're missing? I know you talked about the 3% reduction in the fee rate, but it seems like there's could, could be a little better than that. And just please, you know, feel free to talk me down from that. <laughs> Jim, it's Eric. You know, I'm, I'm trying to come up with a realistic forecast because, to be honest, we'd actually like to be uh, realistic uh, of what we're seeing, and we also want to, uh, maybe back to one of the earlier questions, if we're realistic on revenue, we'll do the right thing on expenses, and so both, uh, both sure. matter in this business. But I think this is a realistic forecast, and obviously, you know, if something, uh, uh, you know, changes dramatically, you know, we'll uh, – uh, up or down, you know, that, that could have an effect. But let me, let me just go through the pieces so that you have a sense. So um, on servicing fees, we said 
uh, to the you know lower middle end of the one to three percent range. So um, you know I think that's pretty clear. I think if you think about it, the equity markets um, in the U.S. Um, on average, uh, and and the averages matter here, um, sure. will probably be up in the uh, uh, you know in the in the high single digits. So that'll provide a couple uh, percentage points tailwind in uh, fees. Um, there may be a little bit of uh, uh, there'll be obviously some amount of net new business, but there's also the fee uh, headwind still that three percent that comes the other way. Uh, yep. that we need yep. to overcome. And so that's why we get to the lower to middle end of the 1% to 3% range. Um, and remember, there are some businesses that are in servicing fees that are driving very uh, uh, quickly. Uh, we've, we've noted, for example, EMEA sometimes or some of the asset management space. But there are others like, uh, you know, our hedge fund clients are actually tending to be relatively stable or even in downdraft in some cases, and so that works in, in different directions. So there's some puts and takes within the portfolio that we're always conscious of. I think on management fees, you know, we said the, the upper end of that range, and I think you can uh, uh, square that with the lower step off in uh, first quarter of 2020 that I, I mentioned um, in my uh, prepared remarks. Um, trading, um, um, you know, I think trading is trading right now. I think you've seen it kind of trend downwards over the last year. I think volatility doesn't feel like it's 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 uh, it's it's moving up fast. It's not moving up fast, right? It's uh, you know, it's stable at best. Uh, uh, leverage, you know, from hedge funds or from uh, those who borrow or lend in the sec finance business. If you look at the industry data, is actually down. You know, year on year, and I don't, I don't see a quick turnaround for that, and so I don't want to gear a business uh, model to you know a, a, an automatic recovery in uh, in trading volatility and opportunities to uh, to find wider margins uh, and so forth. Um, and then there's our uh, uh, software and processing fee other line, um, and I think we've given uh, a good clear guidance on uh, on. Uh, on uh, Charles River, and, and like you say, you just have to be careful about the annualization of the processing fees and other. I think uh, just this quarter, processing fees and other were up about uh, 25 bucks higher than would have naturally been expected than a year ago, quarter over quarter. And if you look at the full year, I think there's, uh, there's that or even a little more in, in full year 19 than in full year 18. So you may want to think about annualizing uh, either both 18 and 19, or even look back to 18, um, just because there's a range of possibilities there. Okay. All fair points. I appreciate the color. Our next question comes from Brian Kleinhansel of KBW. Your line is now open. Great, thanks. Um, a quick question on the guidance. Um, you did mention that there was changes in the leverage ratio coming forward. SCB could also be coming through. Has any of that been that factored into the guidance, or if those came through positively, that would all be incremental to the guidance you gave? Brian, it's Eric. Oh, that's a that's a hard question because uh, if I if I answer it, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna um, show show all my cards, and I can't show all my cards. I don't know what the C car cards are gonna are gonna be like, and so <laughs> that's a that's a tough one. I think what we do now is um, we know the amount of uh, you know capital returns last year. We have some amount of view on this coming year, but we're still guessing. And so I, it, it, it's it's uh, you know you, I think I think what you should probably do from a modeling perspective and what we would expect you to do is think about the capital return levels that we've been at last year, you know, as at least a starting point. Um, I'll I'll, uh, I'll let you uh, you know take a swag if you wanted to add a little more or not um, at that, but at least start with last year's. I think that gives some. Uh, some earnings uh, accretion to the EPS line because of the uh, retirement of, uh, of shares, um, and that should uh, that should factor into uh, uh, your estimates and our uh, that does factor into our, your estimates presumably in our guidance. 
Okay, thanks. And then separately, when you mentioned the pricing headwinds in 2020 of 3%, is 3% the new normal, or do you still expect that to go back towards the 2% level um, of a headwind that has been historically? Brian, it's Eric. That's, that's, that's a hard question to answer now. I think we'll have a better sense of that you know, later this year in 2020, because what, what we'll get to is where are we with clients uh, uh, with whom we, we need to adjust pricing in 17 and 18 or 16. And some of those, you know, they tend to be three, five, seven-year contracts. There'll be some that start to come through. I think there'll be some balance of trade discussions with those clients. There'll be some different types of deals we do in the, you know, in 2020 and 21. Think about the front to back deals have kind of a different patina to them, whether they come with more middle office or uh, uh, sometimes with a broader array of, uh, of uh, services you may not factor in differently. So I think it's just early to tell. I, I, I will I will certainly, I'm sure, at this point next year, give give some kind of indication for 2021. Um, I think we'd like it to come back down to 2%. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we, we don't want to build a business model to that uh, right now, which is partly why we've been so emphatic about, you know, notwithstanding the fee growth that we're expecting this year, that we continue to want to reduce expenses uh, uh, um, in, this, uh, in this plan. Great. Thanks. Our next question comes from Michael Carrier with Bank of America. Your line is now open. Thanks. Just a quick one for me. You, you mentioned in the quarter some market-related adjustments uh, in software fees. Curious just what that was in a material. And then in the 1Q fee outlook, what was the client mix item um, that you highlighted? Sure. It's, uh, it's Eric, uh, Mike. Let me take the, the, the first part of that. Um, on the uh, uh, the, the, um, the market-related uh, items in uh, uh, in the software and processing fees, um, there are several. Um, the larger ones are tied around uh, the asset management business where uh, there are kind of two underlying activities. There's an activity where we seed funds uh, with our own capital, and obviously if those funds do well or if there's a uh, equity market uptake, you tend to have a par positive mark-to-market uh, because they're effectively on our balance sheet. Um, the second one is we've got some uh, compensation programs that tied that are tied to uh, different investment vehicles, and because of how the accounting works, uh, those and and again tied it's I think relatively typical in asset management because the way this accounting works is you you tend to have a, a mark to market effect and the and an accrual effect, but they tend to be uh, at, in different time periods, and so in, in appreciating markets uh, as we had this year, they tend to be positive in falling markets like we had at the very end of uh, uh, fourth quarter of 18, they were negative, and that's why we have a big swing. Those are the uh, – there are a couple other smaller ones, but those are the, the, the lumpy items that we just effectively uh, need to live with. Mike, it's Ron. I'll, I'll, I'll pick up the second part of your question there. Um, it, there we have a very large client where we do uh, – we have a comprehensive asset management relationship with them, and like lots of other, uh, it's a it's a large corporate as it's de-risking. Um, it moved from uh, risk-on type of assets, which have a higher fee, to um, fixed income and liability-driven kinds of investments, which have a lower fee. And this client happens to be large enough that uh, uh, it will be meaningful, uh, assuming it takes place as we expect uh, sometime in early 2020. All right. Thanks a lot. Our next question comes from Mike Mayo with Wells Fargo Securities. Your line is now open. Hi. I have uh, one question that addresses the, the headwind and one for the solution. So uh, first, um, in terms of the, uh, the problem pricing pressure, which you addressed, you said it's gone from 4% headwind to 3% headwind, uh, may, maybe not 2%, but a little bit better. I guess isn't some of that improvement due to the runoff of low-margin BlackRock, um, and um, 
And if you have, you know, assets to be installed equal to three and a half percent of AUC, uh, is that why you, you are conservatively guiding for one to three percent fee growth? Um, and if pricing pressure is really abating on a core level, why is that? Mike, it's Eric. I think there are a couple different pieces there on the on the on the pricing pressure. I think. We, we try to be real uh, distinct in our, uh, certainly internal analysis, but also our disclosure around pricing pressure relative to other drivers of the fee, uh, the servicing fee line. So the other drivers are net new business, which would include a client transition uh, uh, or, uh, or added business. There is, we talk about flows and activity, which has been relatively, uh, you know, modest. And then we talk about markets. So we talk about the different buckets uh, consciously because it helps us better manage and I think if you if you go through some of the description that I gave the, the fee head when we do expect to be uh, lighter uh, from four uh, four percent this past year over year in 2020 we expect it to be closer to three uh, percent I think we do expect some uh, market uplift in 2020 that's in contrast to effectively no market uplift in 2019 if you look at the averages and you look at the averages around the world and, uh, and average those. And then um, on net new business, which, it, which would include some, uh, some of that uh, either uh, added clients or the occasional uh, transition out, um, we do expect that that would be um, a bit positive in 2020 based on some of the uh, the uh, the last uh, year of significant wins, and in 2019, to your point, it was actually uh, uh, flat uh, in effect, and and that was because of uh, that that client transition. So that's a little bit of uh, compare and contrast. Mike, on your question on uh, you know fee pressure itself, um, maybe the better way to describe it is is we, we see the effects of fee pressure abating. And at some level, clients, of course, want to have the best fee proposition that they can. Uh, we've gotten better at managing that, um, and we've gotten better through the addition of additional services like Charles River and the Alpha platform of being able to respond to a fee reduction with a uh, with either a consolidation of business, uh, offsetting new business. Uh, a deeper uh, and broader share of the wallet. So uh, maybe, the, maybe the way to think about it is there's always ongoing fee pressure, and at times that's higher or lower, but it's always there. Uh, in the meantime, we've gotten better at managing it, both in how we actually go about managing, but also in terms of the uh, additional services that we can now bring to bear. And then, um, you know, part of the solution to that, as you've mentioned, is getting more efficient, reduced headcount four quarters in a row, and really technology. So um, I know you just hired a new uh, chief technology officer, um, but if you could just give some sense of your technology priorities. Uh, last year, uh, tech spending, I guess, went up 4% to $2.1 billion. Where do you expect the tech spend to go? Um, and uh, I know I've asked this. I asked this at the annual meeting last year, but... You know, you ended uh, the decade with a 26% uh, pre-tax margin, and it was 29% when you first converted to the cloud. You know, just – and this predates you, Ron, predates you, Eric. But, you know, when you look back at that and you say, okay, what are you going to do different the next few years that you maybe should have done or State Street should have done earlier last decade? So – there's a lot in your question, Mike, and let me try and uh, answer it efficiently. Um, the, the focus last year was on, uh, firstly, being ruthless in our prioritization of what was important um, and tying it uh, much more closely to the needs of the business, firstly, our clients, secondly, what we needed to do for our operating model, and thirdly, what we needed to do for ongoing, improving ongoing operational resiliency. Um, we're very careful about the incremental investments we make, but we need to make them. Um, that has set us up. Uh, that, that uh, if you will, the actions we took in 2019 have set us up now to be focused on what we think are the right priorities. Uh, you know, we let go some personnel that we felt just weren't consistent with the priorities that we'd set. 
Um, and now what we need to do is just get better um, at executing those priorities. Uh, and we feel we've got a plan in place to do that. So uh, what we told you is that uh, you've seen our historic growth. Uh, our intention is to bend that expense growth just like we've bent overall expense uh, growth. Uh, we'll do that through a combination of continuing to reprioritize. Um, the gross impact of that will be um, uh, reasonably high, but it will be offset by the investments that we need to make to continue to be positioned the way we want to be with our clients. And that result of that will be uh, arresting of the growth, but will probably still be slightly up for the year, the way I would think about it. Okay. Uh, so total tech spend should increase, what, like 1%, 2%, any numbers, or just a little bit higher? No, let me let me just uh, clarify. Um, we uh, we were very clear in uh, December that uh, our tech spend has been uh, uh, this this past year, 18 to 19, uh, has been up, right, and up way too high in the high single digits at the eight to nine percent range. And uh, our plan this year, which is factored into the outlook, is to have tech uh, be flat to down two percent. Yeah, and that would be done, which I think is important to understand through, uh, just like we manage overall expenses, there'll be uh, some gross reduction in tech spending offset by a lower amount of tech investment to get us to a uh, flat to slightly down uh, kind of spending. Got it. All right, thank you. Our next question comes from Rob Wildhack with Autonomous Research. Your line is now open. Good morning, guys. Uh, Ron, in December, you highlighted some hiring to target growth in the asset owner space. Can you talk about the um, competitive dynamics in that business and any differences from the asset manager side? And is that something you're emphasizing as a real strategic priority in the near and medium term? Yeah, Rob, we are emphasizing that as a priority for a, a couple of reasons. Uh, firstly, lots of the capabilities that we have um, are increasingly relevant to that space. Uh, the asset owner space uh, in the distant past was much more of a custody only, uh, maybe a little bit of accounting. Uh, and increasingly, asset owners, a uh, typical uh, large and medium asset owner, uh, firstly, is some form of an asset allocator. And in many cases, they have their own investment activities alongside what they're doing with third parties. Uh, so it lends itself to the array of services that we have. The um, cycle time on them tends to be a little bit quicker. Um, so it's a different selling cycle. If it involves Publix, it's a very prescribed selling cycle. So it's something that we believe we can leverage a lot of the capabilities that we have. And it's not like we're not present in that business already, uh, but we believe there's opportunity to grow share as those that segment needs more and more of the distinct capabilities that we have. Got it. And then on um, the asset management side, there's obviously been some consolidation in the e-broker space, and I believe there was some speculation that this could have an impact on distribution of State Street products. Do you think that's the case? And you know, maybe more generally, can you discuss how you're thinking about your distribution strategy as that landscape keeps evolving? That's a good question, and there's, uh, I, I think that uh, that's uh, we're still in early stages in that. Um, I mean, at one level, uh, it uh, it leveled the playing field for distribution. So, uh, for those that were um, in some way sharing revenues or paying to be on platforms, uh, when it goes to zero, you know, you don't write checks anymore for that. So, um, it, it, it's in some cases, for us and others, we're not the only ones, it's reduced our expenses, but it's also uh, it's harder to get, uh, it, it's harder to pay for now a uh, distinctive positioning. What we do think uh, it will cause is with, uh, if you will, transaction fees no longer uh, the primary criterion by many investors, we believe that it's going to, uh, that it should enable us to point investors to what they should be focused on, which is liquidity of the product, uh, the true costs of moving in and out of the product. And we've got um, 
in the spider range, we've got some of the most actively traded products out there. Very liquid, uh, in some cases deeper and more liquid than the underlying assets. So uh, we think this is an opportunity for us to actually focus on the liquidity side and the importance of that for our, uh, for our investors. But early, early days in this. Great. Thank you. Our next question comes from Gerard Cassidy with RBC. Your line is now open. Thank you. Good morning, Ron and Eric. Ron, can you share with us, you talked earlier about business wins, and there's been a whole mix of different products that you've succeeded with this year, um, past year. Can can you talk to the front-to-back business wins, which is new because of Charles River? Um, what types of customers are you seeing um, grab onto that type of full array of products? Is it a completely new customer, or is it no existing customers that are now willing to give you that opportunity to go front to back? Yeah, Gerard, the uh, the, the pipeline uh, uh, is you know what we're pleased about the pipeline is that it's a true mix of clients. Uh, we would have expected that our existing clients or a client where we had a, a large position already uh, and therefore in daily conversations with them uh, would, would be interested in this. And that certainly has played out. And in most of the instances behind in 2019, there was some existing relationship. But what's been uh, particularly gratifying is that uh, we have in the pipeline and working very much through them towards uh, what we would expect to see mandate signed uh, in 2020 or early 21. Clients where we had no relationship or just a very, very minor relationship where they, uh, they see the advantage of being able to have a platform, uh, and it might be all State Street products or it might not, but a platform that integrates it all there uh, and gives them uh, give them the ability to re-engineer uh, re their own business model. It led to, as I said earlier, a, a just an entirely different set of conversations with clients. It's not about, you know, we'll do custody for you at you know, a fraction of this point lower than the other guy. And it's much more about what are you trying to achieve in your business? Uh, how can we help you? Interestingly, um, as you'd expect, some of the clients in the pipeline are those that are, are are challenged by the environment. Others are those that are already winning in the environment and are trying to figure out how they're going to be able to scale for the next five or ten years. So it's it's a rich mix of clients, and we think has a just a, a very very large potential for us as we go forward. Very good. And then uh, maybe Eric, I know there's been a lot of talk on the call about the pricing pressure that you guys have seen, you know, you know, it went up to 4%. Now it seems to be coming in a little bit. And you talked about the mix of your business repricing, which may be, you know, contributing to the, the reduction. Can you talk to the pricing competition, though? Are, are you finding that your competitors are less, you know, price competitive than maybe two or three years ago, or has it really remained unabated? Gerard, it's Eric. I think it's actually a mix of um, competitors in some cases and clients in others that actually drive the uh, the, the pricing, uh, you know, headwinds. And so, uh, if you think about it, you know, we are the largest of the providers to the asset manager segment uh, in the U.S. and in, in uh, around the world as a custodian and uh, and fund accountants. And I think it's those clients, uh, the asset manager clients in particular, that have actually borne the brunt of some of the challenges in the investment industry. And so, in some ways, uh, you know, we're 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 near to the bullseye of where there's disruption in the investments industry, and that's uh, uh, that's um, that's been why I think we've been disproportionately uh, impacted. It's kind of the uh, the effect of having that larger share position. Um, I think we've always seen competitors, you know, come in and out uh, of our industry. 
um, you know, certainly uh, uh, those in the other segments are envious of our position, asset managers. Um, but I, I don't, I don't think it's as much a, a com competition driven change. There's always some of that, but I don't think it's as much of that. And, and I tell you for every, you know, large competitor that's in the ascent, there's a large competitor, you know, who's uh, beginning to, to fade and, you know, focus on other areas or sometimes there's a small disruptor coming in. There are other small uh, players, uh, 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 deciding that there are other areas to, to refocus. So um, I think a little more client-driven than uh, than otherwise. Well, thank you, and I appreciate the time that you spent on the call. Thank you. Thank you. There are no further questions at this time. I will turn the call over to Ron O'Hanley for closing comments. Uh, thanks very much, everybody, for your participation and your interest. This concludes today's conference call. You may now disconnect.